to order the August 24th ACSC board meeting. Um, we will start with introductions. My name is Mary Colony. Chip Malcolm. Meg Martin. Peter Coleman. Mary Gill. Peter Burroughs, Superintendent. Daniel Peter. Dory Jacobite. Susanna Jamer. Hanzo. Uh, Lorraine Morse. Suzanne Bach. Great. Um, just before we get to public comment, I just wanted to talk about two things that we've adjusted based upon requests from uh, folks during public comment. The first is when public comments are made, those individuals will now be moved over as a panelist so that others will be able to see the folks who are talking rather than just hearing them. So it will provide them with an opportunity to have visual as well. And then we also are going to do a readout, I believe, of all of the names of folks who are um, in as, as uh, attendees, because other folks can't see those names, but folks who are attending, only panelists can. And so we want to make sure everybody has a good understanding of who is attending. So, Peter, if you could just do a quick read of those folks who are in as attendees. Sure. Lisa Gomez, Amy Mason, Ashley Lowe, Yarky Sears, Christopher Kramer, Erica Castle, Hugh McLaughlin, Dorena Doria, Kurt Broderson, aka MCTV, and Patrick Dunn. Great. Thank you very much. And if a new individual jumps into the call, we'll make sure that we just recognize that. Um, and, and they can attendees can see the number now of how many attendees they just post these up there. Always, we would like to open up the floor and um, provide the opportunity for a public comment. Uh, if you do have a public comment, please raise your Zoom hand, and Peter will bring you over as a panelist uh, so that we can all see you guys make your comment for those who have video. Hello. Hi, Amy. Hi, thank you for the chance to speak. You can, Amy, you can enable from... video if you want. Um, sure. You don't have to. Did that work? Yep. Okay, thank you for, um, I, I first just wanted to come on and say thank you so much. This is Amy Mason from Weybridge. I'm here with Brian. And we both really appreciate that um, feedback that we offered at the last meeting about the public participation in board meetings was immediately addressed. And we're so grateful for that happening between last board meeting and this one, so that we can know who else is at the meeting and have a chance to see the faces of people who are commenting uh, should they choose that. So I wanted to appre appreciate you all for making that happen. A quick response on that. And also to say thank you for um, the efforts to provide additional communication at a really busy time. I think it provides uh, comfort to people in the community, the efforts to offer porch conversations and, um, and additional newsletter updates and a website improvements. So thank you for that. And just a suggestion on the porch conversations, we did not offer to host um, at our home because we feel that having conversations out in the separate towns um, kind of increases the sense of division in the district. Um, even though it's, it's a wonderful idea and a great invitation and a generous use of the resources of the board members <clears throat> to come out into the communities, we just would love the idea of the opportunity for people to potentially come together um, a bit more centrally. So in case you are wondering why, um, 
that uh, offer hasn't come up from us. I wanted to just offer that as a possible explanation that some people might have. Um, and thank you, and I will see the floor. Can, can I actually make a comment since I don't have an, my own hand to raise? Um, <clears throat> it's Brian, Brian Mason. I, I would like to thank everyone uh, for all the hard work, obviously hard work that has been put into the, um, the re-entry plan and all the health and safety protocols that are going in. Um, I just wanna mention one um, thing that seems to be missing in my mind um, amongst all the, the good stuff that's there is any mention of, of uh, testing in any way. Um, and I am trying to figure out why that wouldn't be addressed. Um, and I'm guessing probably financially might be uh, problematic to, to imagine testing that many people. Um, and I just wanted to sort of put it out there that um, I would imagine some kind of fundraising could happen if that was the case for testing not to happen. I think from a scientific standpoint, finding the uh, asymptomatic people would probably be um, in everyone's interest in keeping schools open and hopefully moving forward in getting everyone um, back more full time. Um, and, and I think it really makes sense, if possible, to look into some kind of testing. Uh, yeah, for faculty and staff, for students, for, for you know, <laughs> people there. So thank you. Chris Kramer. Hi, can you all hear me? Yep, yep we can hear you. Okay, there we go. Trying to position my, my video perfectly so that the photos of Ethan when he was a baby are, are right up there behind me. He's going into second grade at Cornwall, but <clears throat> you can ignore this face, but you can't, you can't ignore, the, especially the one with the hat. That's, that's my wife's favorite there. Um, I just wanted to share with you all, uh, I sent you guys an email, um, FOCS, the Friends of Cornwall School, uh, put out a survey this uh, past week um, to uh, everybody in the school directory. Uh, it's not fully updated, but we did the best we could um, for, the, for the new year. Um, and um, got a really high response rate back uh, eighty-five percent of folks uh, responded. Um, in terms of, uh, it was a one-question survey, um, so I sent you guys the the chart um, of just where people stand um, on the issue of consolidation and closure of, of Cornwall School. Um, and you can see uh, from the results, it sh should be in everybody's email. Um, you know, there were a wide range of comments um, submitted as well, um, but where folks came out was, um, and we, we tried to really kind of balance the language um, and we actually put support first and listed a number of reasons why um, folks you know, might support it and we really didn't wanna sort of prejudge the outcome. So you know, we listed <clears throat> um, you know, addressing property, uh, excuse me, uh, address, well, there is property taxes, but addressing population trends, property taxes, and I think the, one that you know really I think folks have started to hone in on uh, at the board level, which is increasing services um, and opportunities for education. Um, and we really wanted to be kind of matter of fact uh, about that and and put that out there so that folks understood not it wasn't just do you support or or not you know closing Cornwall School um, because obviously that kind of could you know swing things in one direction. Um, but we also wanted to be balanced kind of in both directions. So then we also gave the option of, of not supporting it, um, sort of the things that you typically hear kind of um, <clears throat> in terms of the small school experience um, and the community, you know, value of community and all of that. And I actually really genuinely didn't know where it was going to come out. In fact, the reason we actually, my co-chair and I did the survey um, is, this is my second year now being 
uh, the FOCS co-chair. My first year, last year, um, I had a different co-chair who was uh, Lori Sperry, who was somebody who'd been around for a while. So I kind of just took the lead from her um, to a large degree. Lori's great. She's she's set back um, this year. Um, but kind of, you know, stepping up this year, I wanted to just get a better sense of where folks were in the school community on the issue um, as we thought about for FOCS, how to engage on it. And both my new co-chair, Molly Daly, and I felt like, you know, we kind of knew what we thought, but we didn't, we really genuinely didn't know what we felt, what we thought, <clears throat> how we thought people would come out on it overall, because we've had conversations individually with people um, that go in both directions. Um, and I think one of the things you often hear is there may be kind of more pro-consolidation folks out there than, you know, you might realize or hear from because folks, especially at the outlying schools who might be in favor of it, um, you know, may just want to stay a little quiet because they feel kind of pressured not to speak up too much about it. And I thought that was actually very possible. I have individually had conversations like that. So that's, that's a real thing. Um, but we didn't know how it would come out overall. And as you can see, uh, folks, you know, I mean, it is pretty heavily weighted. Um, and of course, we're, it's framed in terms of Cornwall in particular. Um, but nonetheless, um, folks came out about 80% against, um, a little under 10% in favor. And we did give the option of kind of uncertain or neutral, um, which I think was came out of around 11%. And again, that's around 85% of the whole directory responding. So that's that's sort of where things stand as best we can tell um, right now. And I think, um, you know, I've been trying to think through, I mean, as I said, we really did it because we wanted to understand as FOCS how to engage and how to kind of as best we could represent the community. We're not the only voice, obviously, but we are a voice for the school families. Um, and, and um, I, you know, I, I don't know that I can draw um, complete conclusions at this point of what to do with this um, information. I think it's clear that, you know, the community, that there is a lot of um, for lack of a better word, opposition that, you know, I'm not trying to be controversial, but I just, just the opposition to it. Um, and um, I know that you guys described at the last board meeting, a bunch of um, educational um, efforts that you're engaging in now, um, including the porch conversations that Amy mentioned. Um, I think there's a long way to go in terms of um, trying to help folks understand um, you know, where, um, where things are going and why. Um, and I think what I would suggest is um, maybe using the porch conversations and the other educational opportunities as more than just an opportunity to kind of from one, from, you know, from the board standpoint, explain why um, you guys are going in one particular direction. You know, let's say the direction that Truex has has recommended, and rather really use it as an opportunity to brainstorm with people in these smaller conversations. Um, Victoria and I had a conversation in the spring about possibly trying to do that, and then of course COVID hit. So what conversations look like is a lot different now than we might have expected they would be over the summer. Um, but trying to get people in a room to do some brainstorming. I think there's still an opportunity. I don't think we have to, I think David and Truax have done a great job. They're really well-meaning, um, but they're looking at things primarily through a facilities lens. And I think that we have an opportunity to take a step back now and say, okay, they did a great job for what they were asked to do, um, but let's see how we can be creative and listen to folks so that we don't necessarily see community as a value and education as a value as competing values. Um, but can we come up with a creative solution that doesn't necessarily just march forward with what the report recommended, but actually um, tries to incorporate and make everybody kind of feel better about um, where we're headed? Because I think right now, at least in Cornwall, uh, and at least at the school, uh, you know, we're not there yet. Um, so that's, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Oh, I just want to mention we did put the survey onto Front Porch Forum also, and it's too early because it just came out. But I'll 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 update you guys um, 
with what we get back on that as well. Great, thank you. Okay, that's it. We have a few more people attending. Mary Heather Noble, Patrick Dunn, Wendy Harlan, and Zara Daly. Thank you very much for taking the time to share those thoughtful presentations and Chris, we appreciate it. Um, next on our agenda is a recommendation to approve the minutes of July 27th and the August 22nd. Um, so I have a motion to approve. Sure. Okay. Any discussion or comments on this? I, I have one comment. Uh, those are hard minutes to take, especially. Uh, and I congratulate you, Dan, doing a good job. And there's a little bit of stream of consciousness to some degree, having read them, but I think that really captures a lot of this sort of uh, discussion that we had, especially with the two people really make actions, so to speak. So thank you, Suzanne. Any other questions? I, I, I just want to check in with Suzanne to make sure she's in Europe, okay? No, you can't hear. Everything is mumbled, and you can kind of hear voices. But what was just said, I have absolutely no clue. Yeah, I didn't hear the last uh, two or three people either. Jen, can you hear me now? Uh, I think you can change the microphone. Oh. Is that better? That's better right now. Yeah. Go ahead, Chip, say your. Suzanne, I was just, uh, after the motion to approve the minutes on both meetings, I was congratulating you on doing a good job. There are hard minutes to take, especially of the retreat. And you, uh, even though it was somewhat of a stream of consciousness, at least that's how I looked at it for all of us, uh, uh, I thought it captured uh, what we were doing. So thank you. You're welcome. Great. Great. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any guests? Great. Both so Mary, who made the motion and who seconded uh, it? The motion was Peg. Second was sure. I, I second. You I second. Think, yeah. Great. Chip was second. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, next up is to approve the ACSD bills. Uh, there are uh, two sets of bills. The first was the uh, were read on August the third. Uh, <clears throat> the general account, and these were read by myself and presumably uh, Victoria, but I don't see her, so <laughs> yeah, she couldn't make it tonight. Yeah. Um, and, the, and so that first for the general account was $198,869.05. And the second voucher was for um, uh, teachers, labor, um, $147,522.50. And then the second set of bills, actually it's just one bill, uh, one voucher for uh, 
817, uh, 2020, for $148,555.54. Uh, and I make a motion to uh, pay the bills as written. I'll second it. Second from Peggy. Second from Suzanne. Oh, second from Suzanne. Great. Thank you, Chet. Um, you have to vote on that motion. Sorry? You have to vote on that motion. Yeah, I have to vote. You have to vote. You have to say aye. Oh, oh. The <laughs> uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, all those opposed? Great. Well done. Sorry. Approve the bill. Um, report of the superintendent. I think our first order of business is welcoming our two next students. Yeah. Great. So Kyle Mitchell, senior, um, Henry Carpenter, junior, are joining us. Um, all of you know the work that went into making this possible. Mary, do you want to say a few words? Uh, yes, I'm. I'm really pleased that we have them, uh, and I, I know both of them from their previous years in school. So I'm very pleased. Um, the I, I just I want to ask them: Have you received all of the board pack information, and you've been able to read through where we where we are? Um, I've gotten emails about what the overview is, but not about the, what we can check. Okay. So um, I, I met with Kyle okay. this past week, but we weren't able to connect. So we're going to meet after this meeting to okay. go over some more details and, and do a training. Okay. Yeah. Because I had mentioned that Henry and I, I know Kyle was part of our early discussion helping us put the policy together. And one of the um, pieces we really felt was important when the board accepted the idea of doing this as a student representative is that the board would have would see the procedure that was you know that was put out which we haven't seen yet and i understand there's been a lot going on so it wasn't a high priority but we also felt strongly that a training was part of it and that we they, we would provide them with some membership so I'm glad you're going to do the training, but I want to open it up to them if we can also offer a mentor um, from the board, because I know I myself, for the first two years, I was lost most of the time. And so I think coming in as a student without having some clear understanding of what boards do would be helpful. So I'm offering myself up as a mentor, and I know there's others here who would also be willing to do that. Okay. I had the same thought, and I just think uh, maybe uh, folks could send their interest to Mary, and Mary could assign mentors to. Great, I can do that. Okay, perfect. Well, welcome. Um, we appreciate your time and your commitment to this. Uh, you know, speaking from my perspective, I, I think the idea of representation is so important, <coughs> and it is, it allows us to bring to debate and and the work that we do in things like a board or policy in general representation means that it's just not one perspective and it's certainly not a self-serving perspective uh, and i think that is um we are an important time for that right now and so uh, i hope that you both work really hard to think about how can the voice that you bring to this debate and to these discussions how can that voice be representative and help us understand that and we really look forward to having that be part of it so thank you for your time do you each want to share a little bit about how you got here, what you're excited about? So I was, there were some emails sent out by Mr. Lawson last year and I applied. Um, and then we had gotten together March before the whole pandemic started. And I was just really interested to do this because as you said, representation and I don't think many students actually really know what goes on behind the scenes. So it's really important to me that even just to my friends, they can know a little bit more about what's happening. Great. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Kyla Mitchell. Um, so um, again, similar, there was a, a Mr. Loss reached out to the student body, um, both individually and uh, an email version, et cetera. And um, I wrote a letter of intent um, and from there, uh, was uh, in the process of being accepted, and um, I would say I am 
most excited to be here to be part of um, part of um, something that's very important um, to the school district that uh, that makes decisions that impact all. Um, it can be decisions that impact uh, one school or the entire district. Uh, but I look forward to learning the process as getting experience as a as a younger adult, younger student um, to carry forth. But I also look forward to um, to being engaged and involved in the work that is being done. Um, so thank you. Welcome. Very very much. Um, so I'm going to start talking about the reentry plan, um, the work we've been doing. There's a lot to cover, and a lot has been happening really um, since we since we met a couple weeks ago. It seems like years ago. Uh, we had staff come back. Staff came back on Wednesday, um, and we are really, I think, in the guts right now of, of figuring out some of the final pieces of what uh, teaching and learning looks like this year looking at policy and operations and, and kind of figuring out um, some things that, that we need to be either prepared for if we switch phases um, or things that we need to, to kind of really come together on by September 8th. So I, I think we're still um, working kind of up here on the high level. We're also really kind of um, down in the nuts and bolts to make sure that we're ready, um, that people really understand what's happening. and. So we're fielding lots of questions. We're, um, I think, not us just at the central office. I'm us. I'm saying ACSD as a whole. Um, all of us are um, working with community members, with students, with parents to to help kind of bring them into what this kind of start is going to look like. So I wanted to uh, briefly go through the reentry plan because I think that would be helpful. Um, for the board to kind of understand and, and to be able to, to feel grounded and answer and ask questions and get answers from all of us in terms of uh, what we're thinking about and what we're planning for in um, what we think will be a, a pretty interesting year. Has everyone had a chance to look at this? Does everyone want a copy? I brought hard copies. In case. Thank you. Yep. Sure. Sometimes it's nice just to have a paper copy. <laughs> so the, um, the document starts out with just an introduction for me in, in terms of the process and really kind of considering what is our vision as a community in, in thinking about the, the kinds of decisions we need to make over the course of this year what's going to be driving us what are going to be our priorities how are we going to make sure that we don't get lost in all the details and how do we stay focused on what's important i think above and uh, above all um, you know health and safety is is at the very top and it's why, although it's incredibly challenging, it's why we're starting in a hybrid model. Um, and that is a conversation that I share with all of you that, that um, superintendents had across the, the regional group that I'm a part of. Uh, looking at the, the state guidance starting in step two, looking at what's happening in other states, coming back from a remote period of three months where we just kind of like hit pause on education in person entirely. Um, it, I, the more we get into and the closer we get to the start of school, I feel even stronger that starting in a hybrid model makes a lot of sense. Um, so we're starting in hybrid, as you know, um, on page seven, um, this document goes into what the different phases might be that we will confront this year. Um, the, the state has three different phases. They call them steps. So this document has both steps and phases. The reason we went with phases is because we wanted to add a fourth phase, which is one-on-one -on -one small groups where we're really able to prioritize a few students or a smaller group of students that need to come back. We want to have that as one of the phases we can potentially lead to. 
Um, so that's why we've, we've chosen to have four phases instead of the state's three. Um, those of you that have spent time in state guidance also know that the steps are really fairly confusing. So if you read all through, these are the, the guidelines I've sent a number of times in different communications, help, healthy, strong and healthy start. Can't remember the exact title. Step two, if you read through all the guidance, the health and safety guidance, and you read through step three, you'll find that it's hard to differentiate between the two. They're, they're pretty close. I, I think, I'm not sure why. Um, and I'll talk about step two and step three in a moment. Um, so anyway, we're, we're, we've created these four phases that we're going to be referencing kind of throughout the year as we're looking at where we are and where we may need to transition to. So the, 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 the purpose of this document is not necessarily to ground us in one phase or in one direction, but to provide us with the ability to move back and forth fairly quickly between phases and to be prepared for that so the wheels don't completely fall off when, let's say in four weeks, we get an uptick in COVID cases and we either have to close one school or we have to close all schools or we have to start quarantining groups. Not just the, the staff and the schools know what to do, but the community as a whole knows what's happening can predict what's happening and can be with us as we're transitioning between phases. And that is going to be really, really important. So um, page 14, transitioning between steps and phases, talks a little bit about how we foresee moving back and forth. Um, I, I skipped over the health and safety guidelines. And this is really just a quick overview of the, the actual document, which some of you may have looked at. I sent that out uh, previously. It's also on the COVID website tab. If you haven't checked that out, that's as of last week that went live. That's where all this information is. It's about 50 pages. And that that those health and safety guidelines will also be iterative. So what we know today may change in a week. And if you talk to Kelly Lambert, who is our COVID coordinator, it's a new position that she's filled along with being our nurse leader. So she's making changes to that document frequently. And that's primarily because of state guidance changing and then us having to adapt what we're doing here. So you can see on page. Um, 15 and 16 and 17, we start to, this is again, a very high level document, but this just discusses a little bit about our teaching and learning models and our, how we're going to be approaching both online and offline learning. One of the questions that a lot of um, students and families have had over the last few weeks after they understood that we were starting in a hybrid model with two days in person and three days out is, how does that work in terms of a, a student that I, I understand in person, right? We all understand what happens in person learning, but what happens at home? And what our, our teachers are working on is designing right now for remote instruction and in person in the classroom is an opportunity for students to personalize, to apply, to um, collaborate, to receive extra support, all those kinds of things. So teachers are, as we speak right now, they got the same document, they got the work that we did over the summer, they're not figuring out, so what does that really look like? Um, and, and as we go through this really long pre-service of 13 days, um, teachers are, are kind of getting down to the very kind of like, what is this gonna look like for a student that's chosen fully remote and what is it going to look like for a student that I'm going to see for two days a week? Um, there's also information in here in, in regards to communication, how we are going to be uh, continuing to communicate. I've shared a little bit about some of the uh, structures that the communications action team has put into place to keep people connected. Uh, and, and you'll be seeing more communication this year probably than 
any time you've ever seen before because it is so important on page 19 this some of the things that we are we are planning for communication um, and I, um, page 18 is the student support so that work happened alongside the um, or kind of within the continuity of learning we uh, Caitlin and Vicki together kind of built this structure so it's not a structure here and a structure there but it's one unified structure um, and then the um, final part of this is food service and transportation. Again, all these things look different now than they have. So we, we have to be a little bit more methodical in mapping out this is what it's going to look like in this phase. This is what's going to look like if we go fully remote. Uh, and I, I would say we spent a lot of time problem solving the operational pieces that uh, we make so many assumptions about in kind of quote unquote regular life where things just kind of run once you figure them out. A lot of those assumptions or a lot of those kind of standardized automatic things are no longer applicable. So we're having to, to think through both, how is this going to function? How does transportation work? And then realize, okay, there's also the career center and they're running four days a week and they have different times. And so all of these kinds of things start to Come together so we're still we're still working out some of that but I, I think we're we're pretty much um, close to there in terms of the operational pieces the the timeline in terms of the this first um, hybrid phase I, I mentioned this in my communication on Friday to the community the the regional superintendent group that I'm a part of we, we talked a lot about what are the metrics we're going to use to determine how we're doing and we haven't been given those by the state. The state hasn't said, here's what you should do, or these are the, the, the COVID numbers have to be right here or have to be right here for you to come back fully in person or not. So there's a, a lot left up to districts right now to figure some of these things out. Obviously, in working, working together with the Vermont Department of Health and the Agency of Education with the question. But in terms of specific metrics, we haven't been given that. What we've been given are those, those Healthy Start guidelines, strong and Healthy Start guidelines, uh, which tell us, okay, you're in step two, which is where schools are starting, uh, or you're in step three or step one, which is back to March when we, when we close. That's pretty much step one. So we'll be spending, you know, this first, it's going to go really quickly. Um, the first four weeks, we're going to be looking at the criteria that I shared on Friday and, and discussing with state, state representatives, with our local Vermont Department of Health and Mark Cook, um, with obviously the nurses will be a big part of that conversation too. We'll be looking at our systems. We'll be determining if, if we're in a good place in terms of staffing and we have enough staffing. Um, so if, if things stay the way they are, if the numbers in Vermont stay very low, um, you know, when you hear about a COVID case in Addison County, you're, you're surprised, right? That's the way it's been. Uh, whether that continues or not, obviously nobody knows, um, but we will be in, in four to six weeks is the, the window that we all, that all the superintendents agreed would be a reasonable time period to look at is would it be um, time after four to six weeks to begin a transitional process to go fully in person and that could include just pre-k six or it could include all depending the focus at the state level has been pre-k five they used age 10 which made it a, a fifth grade and some districts have pre-k five not pre-k six like we did so that's the process we'll be using I, again in, within four to six weeks we'll be we'll be kind of assessing where we are and communicating with the public to say this is the time period we told you we're going to be reassessing hybrid here's what we think we need to do um, i mentioned earlier hybrid, the hybrid model has a lot of challenges in terms of having people in half time it, it's easier either to be all in or all out, right? 
but in terms of health and safety and bring bringing students back in and starting to create those connections, we feel like hybrid is, is a good place to start. Not a place that we're planning to be all year. And that's been one of the messages I think we've all been really focused on sharing because as human beings, we really want regularity. We want to lock into a system. We want to get into something that we can predict what's happening today is also going to happen tomorrow. And that's been true in my communications with parents, with staff, whomever. It, it's very easy to get lulled into a okay, hybrid, like this is what the year is going to look like. And I'm saying, no, this is not, we're not planning on staying here. Um, we're hoping to transition to fully in person uh, if the conditions support. It. So I wanted also to then um, just to, to give the board like a, a full picture here to allow Caitlin, Vicki, and Brittany to share a little bit about the work they're doing. Um, as I mentioned, Vicki and Caitlin are the COL leaders, and Brittany is policy and operations. Just to, to give a little bit more detail about where they are in the work and information that would be helpful to the board. Great. So, um, so I'm going to just, I'll, I'll speak about um, in general, how we started, and then I'll have Caitlin take over, and then I'll come back and I'll talk about student supports. Um, but we we felt as we as we did this, and I think we've described to you before, our, our team was large. We had 39 individuals total on our team. And so what we did is we had a larger advisory team that we worked with that we ran almost everything by. And then we had smaller groups. We had an instruction group as well as a student support group. And the instruction group had 11 members. The student support had 14. And so then multiple stakeholders on all of those. And what we did is we did our work in our small groups. And then we came together um, as, as the two directors and our coordinators to share some information, home things. Then we would bring it back to the advisory group. So there were multiple reiterations, and we also used the um, recovery planning team as a larger um, focal point to just help us refine. And and kind of every time that somebody picked it up, they brought it just a little bit further, and then we refine it, and then another group would grab it and bring it a little bit further. And I think we both found that there were pieces kind of left hanging along the way. So we were trying to, as we went along, to to kind of collect everything and move everything forward. But one of the big pieces that we did discuss is, as many of you um, have heard, we are really taking a look at the work that the district management group did. And with our overall um, system of services design team, what is it that we need to shift about our system of services for all students in order um, to look at increased outcomes? And so all of the work that I described to the board, I think very quickly before we closed, um, was, was in what that system needs to look like. And so in order, we started to take this as an opportunity to really think about if that's where we wanna be for the 21-22 school year, how do we use this opportunity this year with hybrid and so many other things going on and realistically redefining education as it is, how do we use this year as a bridge to the next year as we really start to flip our systems? So, Caitlin, do you want to talk for a bit, and then I can come back to the student support? Yeah, sure. So I just reiterating that we don't expect that we're coming back to education when we all come back and everything is normal again, like we were before. So many things have been upended, and we really have tried to take it as an opportunity to bridge ourselves forward to the future. Um, Vicki mentioned these two teams, and one thing that she didn't mention was how carefully we constructed those teams. So we had a lot of representation of parents and students and various educators on the advice, the big advisory team. The instruction team included special educators and a special education coordinator, and the, and the support team included classroom teachers and two IV coordinators. So we were actively cross-pollinating the working groups, trying to really blend more seamlessly the work that, that general education and special education were doing together. It was really messy work and very iterative, as she described. Um, and we, we created a structure that we hope teachers now will build within. We couldn't create perfect clarity, 
without their voice in the room. And so now, as, as Vicki mentioned, like one group would pick, would pick it up and move the work a little bit forward, and then the next group would pick it up and carry it further. And honestly, very much of the work now is in the hands of the teachers. And so we're, uh, over these next couple of weeks and starting last Wednesday, really hearing what are the pinch points and what are the questions that they're experiencing so that we can continue to refine guidance for what education will look like for students is being built right now by our teachers. Um, we are, we, Peter mentioned that the teachers are really working on, on remote first, designing for remote first. We made a decision this summer to, to not, um, not sign our kids up for Vermont uh, virtual learning, but rather to continue to support them locally with our locally developed IB curriculum and our local support systems. And so students are assigned to a classroom teacher or at the secondary level to their various classroom teachers. And those learning communities will carry them through the whole year. So that means that a teacher is teaching students who have elected to be 100% remote, and they're teaching students who are on site and off site. Um, it's, it's hard, it's a heavy lift. It's also agile in that a, if a student has a temperature or a, or a teacher has a temperature or any other belongings of symptoms, they are out for a day or more, a week, two weeks if they are stuck quarantining. So we decided that really, we couldn't anticipate where the students would be. And so we need to design first for the ones who are hardest to access because they're not with us. And so if we design entirely for remote instruction and then understand what's the value added when we have them on site, and it really is leading into um, you know, developing robust teaching and learning relationships and providing personalized support. And this is good pedagogy, but it's also steep professional learning part. It's a, it's a new model. So, um, we're doing a couple of things over in service. We are rolling a new learning management system for our elementary schools. So all of you in this program is called Toddle. And we're- and What was that again? Toddle. Toddle. T-O-D-D-L-E. Toddle. Toddle. It's designed uh, for the IBQIP. It will be the interface that teachers, students, and parents use. It allows a lot of dynamic uh, reporting of evidence so kids can submit their work, you know, in a traditional format or a voice recording, or it's, it's pretty dynamic. So we're learning deeply about that the elementary level right now, and we decided to do more of our work and manage that than we did before. So we have used it as a grading platform and a progress reporting platform before. It's also a learning management system. It's also an interface that we can use with parents, students, and teachers. And so we're really leaning heavily into those two tech platforms which is a lot of professional learning for our teachers right now. We're also really leaning heavily into um, professional learning around blended learning as a concept. So what does it look like to meaningfully mix uh, screen time, online time, and all the other pedagogical moves that we can make to connect students to their learning to really balance our instruction to get off screen as much as we're able. So, um, that's the work that's happening right now, but did you want to, we haven't talked about those priorities that inform that. Right, right. why don't you talk about the priorities and then I'll, I'll come back to the student supports. So we, um, we had we had a series of, Vicki and I combed through all of our summer work to try to boil down the major priorities which drove it. It, it sort of came in various sort of surveys and brainstorms and so health and safety, as, as Peter said, is the first thing. Because of the health and safety guidelines, we're starting hybrid. And so, so much of this is designing around that. We're really focused on social emotional wellness of both our students and our staff. Um, connection, and we just wrote it as connection with peers because that's both for our students and for our staff who also need connection with their peers. Equity of access and opportunity. Access to a well-rounded education, both balancing academic rigor um, and all subject areas. So last last spring, we significantly reduced the amount of learning time to just get through that crisis period. We're increasing it again to say we're settling into what it will be a very disruptive year. We still need to offer a rigorous academic curriculum 
And in the spring at the elementary level, some of our content areas are to movement, among others, were, were optional. Families could just opt out of that. But those are part of a well-rounded curriculum. And so they're no longer optional this year. Um, other priorities, designing for learning diversity, meeting all of our students where, where, where they are in the ways that we can move them along. Flexibility, agility, and the option to opt out of the family. So we needed to be able to meet our students, as we said, not knowing necessarily any given day or week where they'll be, whether they'll be with us on site or at home, and a real focus on community. So those are the priorities that drove our work. Yeah, and then um, and then we added a little bit to the to the student support. Um, and again, looking at the premise, we had several premises that we were working for, from. And the first was that, that this really was building a bridge toward greater systems change, that we were going to increase our focus on inclusive practices, that we wanted to make sure that the work that student supports did was aligned with and provided access to the general ed curriculum. We wanted to make sure that we were building multi-layered um, systems of support within each building to ensure that all students had the support that they needed and the recognition that none of this work is done in isolation. It requires a high level, high level of collaboration um, as well as collaborative planning. And that's what a lot of the Wednesdays are for. We also um, started to really think about the idea that in the reality that all kids are general ed kids first and foremost, and some have additional needs that require specialized instruction and supports that the extended closure impacted all of our students, not just some of our students, all of our students were impacted by the closure. And we really need, as we come back, to emphasize supporting students who struggle. And the students who struggled prior to closure may be a very different group that are struggling once we start to come back on site. So we really need to think about how do we, how do we assess and get a good baseline for where all kids are at. Um, really taking a look at how do we ensure that when teachers are collaborating, that we're focusing on what are we teaching, who are we teaching, and how are we teaching it, so that we can get at the universal design that Caitlin was talking about. Um, and really thinking about what is the data that we need to be looking at for all students? What is the pre-COVID data? What is the baseline data that we're working with? And then what is the growth rate data for once kids are back in school and, and, um, and on site with some of the in-person? And so we just then started to look at all of the supports that teachers had. And, um, and again, you know, it, it certainly isn't perfect. We're working through a lot of the questions and the answers as we go. One of the things that, that happened in the midst of all of this is that we got um, information from the state. So special educators um, are required to amend all IEPs prior to September 8th. When we went to extended closure, we were working off of what was called distance learning plans. And it was a, it, it didn't replace IEPs, but it shifted the focus. Um, and now the, the state has said, we cannot no longer do DLPs. And so they're requiring all special educators to, uh, to amend all IEPs for three phases of learning, fully in person, hybrid, and fully remote. So we have worked with special educators over the past um, several days to get them up and running um, so that they can hold those meetings. So, so as you may hear, it's not all special educators have been involved in all aspects of the PD because this is a priority that they've been working on. Um, I don't know if I should be pointing to the microphone, but um, my question is, how will parents um, receive guidance on, on the remote learning pieces? I'm sure many parents are going to struggle with the different programs and getting in and trying to figure out what's happening. How will they get uh, guidance on that? And is there, there going to be a, a feedback loop? Should they have a question that they can get a response in a fairly quick period of time? Yeah, and I don't know if others want to answer, but but hopefully the, the communication is going out on a pretty, pretty regular basis, and my hope would be that we're planning surveys 
So um, we, yeah, we certainly, we did a lot. We have conducted several surveys since the since school closed, and I imagine we'll continue to do that as we <laughs> as we reflect on how things are going and look for information. But that's not the fastest way to get action, right? So I would say that a more direct line of communication for a parent is straight to the teacher or to the principal. Who they they if they need an answer that's a more collective answer they you know how to access us pretty quickly and easily. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the learning, as far as moving to Toddle and manage that as our two learning management systems, is that, that those two programs at the elementary level Toddle and the secondary level manage that, those become the landing pad for everybody. And so we haven't designed it yet, but we've already had conversations about what what training do we need to give. To to parents, to families, um, er, early on, I, ideally, you know, if we can pull it off next week, but very soon, so that they understand how to navigate those systems and who to go to for support and for help. So we see that as a need and we're working on it. Right now, we're really trying to get our teachers up to speed on those programs. That was my third question. How are the teachers doing? <laughs> this must be. Today was a hard day. Awesome. <laughs> um, I think it's hard for, for a lot of people. I mean, we really, we have, in essence, in the last, I mean, we reinvented education under a crisis in March, and we really have shifted significantly. And so we're asking them to take years of learning and undo a lot of that. Yeah, it's appropriate to be empathetic for teachers right now. Yeah. They have a heavy lift. Um, we were very thoughtful in our decisions to move to those two platforms knowing that we need to sort of sprint to learn what we need to learn to do those, to implement those well. But the alternative was to continue to pack together multiple different programs. That was pretty unnavigable. That was very overwhelming for our community. And so we decided to really invest in one thing at each level, um, rather than try to write guidelines and rules for how we weave multiple platforms together. And we're preparing you know, our the spring was reactive. We we used what tools we had, and you know, some some people had used Google Classroom, and we you know push push that alongside our school. Um, we're thinking of this entire year really differently. We're we're really trying to to be thinking about what's going to be most helpful in February or March, as opposed to just thinking about right now and maybe a vaccine will come next month but we're we're planning for a full year and we want students to be successful in this year so we're, we're putting in some of that that foundational work that we also are thinking once we're through this period the opportunity right now to make some of these changes that sometimes take a lot longer um, you know it, it's it's much easier to learn them now as we have to learn something new anyway, and then kind of build those into the future. So we, we are also thinking not just about this plan is for this year, and then we're going to kind of go back to where we were before. We're going to actually move forward out of this into something better. First, thank you. Beyond thank you. Um, truly remarkable. Um, a couple questions on kind of like, you know, recognizing prior knowledge and a child comes into a, a new school year with an expectation of being at a certain level of standard or understanding. That has been dramatically impacted for a, a significant number of kids based upon where their education finished off last year. So talk a little bit more about how you're thinking about the analysis of that new baseline and then the remediation and additional support that more kids than usual are going to need. And how do you get, how, how do you think about that? Yeah, well, it's especially hard because we can't actually anticipate what students did and didn't learn last spring. Some of them will have lit up in some areas and it jumped way ahead, and others will have fallen behind for a completely understandable reasons and so and i so we know that we both know that we need solid research-based screeners and we also know that that's not the first thing we want to make students do right right so we're trying to welcome them 
back into a learning community, not immediately start seeing, um, scanning their skills. Right. So, do you want to speak more to what we're looking at for screeners, maybe? Yeah. So we're we've got we've got um, the screeners that we have used before. I know that um, we at the elementary level we have used fast for our kiddos for math and for literacy, and they have a small portion around social emotional, but we have a social emotional team looking at a different screener for social emotional, so hopefully that will come out soon. And our middle school and our high school use, um, I think it's called Star 360. And it does give us a baseline of where kids are at, and then you can also utilize them to progress monitor to get a, get a sense of what their um, rate of growth is over time. I think the biggest piece that we all need to understand is that is that yes, kids, all kids have been impacted. And like Caitlin said, we had some kids who did amazing that we wouldn't have anticipated. And we also had some kids that we wouldn't have anticipated not, not do great. And bottom line is we've got to take kids in where they come in. And we can't assume just because they're walking into a fourth grade classroom in September that they are fourth grade one month into any level of reading, writing, or anything else. We've got to get a general sense of where our kids are at. And classroom teacher, along with support from others, really needs to take those kids and bring them to the next level, whether they're here or here or someplace in between. That's our role as a larger education system, is, is the, the pandemic and the extended closure it wasn't just a small cohort of kids that it impacted. It really was all. And it's going to take the system to support them, not just yeah. I mean, I appreciate the understanding. I think it's going to not just here in, in our, our community, I think across the country, it's going Absolutely. to put a significant yeah. stress on a system that is already stressed. And, and one of the pieces that, that we're really push, you know, thinking about and talking about is we have heard multiple times that it's going to take the economy three to five years to recuperate from this or to possibly recover from this. It's going to take that, if not longer, for education as, as a system to recover. From this, so we really need to start thinking about that and planning that forward. So, but related to this, is when we talk, we we've had people say, "Well, how much of the curriculum will we get for this year?" And we we adamantly not given a percentage, but let's not pretend we actually know how much of the curriculum we're going to get for this year. And instead, what we need to do is get really clear on on our on what are the priority learning goals, not. Not which ones are we eliminating, but what are the most critical ones? So that as a teacher, so a teacher, when they're seeing the pacing that's functioning with their classroom, knows where the release valve in, in their curriculum is, what they can let go of first if they can't fit it all in. Um, so really getting clear on, on what are the learning goals and really emphasizing skills over content, really focusing on if we need to cut something. We're not cutting skills. We still have to develop for students the skills that they're going to need to access the curriculum next year. But we can let go of some of the content that they're not doing. That's less true for the diploma program classes, which have external assessments. And so we are also having real conversations about how do we support those DP candidates to access all the curriculum that they'll need for those external assessments. And so we're pleased to support them for that as well. And my, my second and last question on this um, is how, I, I think one of the challenges right now that is out there, and that's really some of the limited value that we can provide is that we hear things, um, is that this the in-person days are, I get to go and hang out with my friends. And so, and that's seen by kids as I get to go and hang out with my friends, and it's seen by some folks as, wow, this seems like a wasted instructional opportunity. Why am I sending my kids into a community or a school where now there's increased risk for fill in the blank if there's not instruction happening then? And so I think the, the challenge is, is how do we put language to how important those in-school days are and really help folks understand what's happening on those in-school days because it shouldn't be diminished. They're critical to their development. And I'm afraid people are making decisions because they don't understand really what's happening on those days. Interesting. To some extent, I think we're, we're taking this as an opportunity to learn about a more modern pedagogy that, that serves students better. 
right? The idea of, of not lecturing as much because we can deliver that content remotely and instead really tailoring support for far fewer students who are in the room. So the students are all receiving the same curriculum, whether they're on site or not, but those students who are on site have, you know, in-person opportunities to, to ask questions, express need, collaborate with peers, get one-on-one -on -one and small group support from teachers. So I, I think that though that in-person time will be quite precious to our educators. Completely we, agree. It's a messaging issue. <laughs> right. They, I think they, they will make phenomenal use of it. Yeah. But what they won't be doing is is predominantly delivering content on those days because they don't have access to all of their kids on those days. And so they're going to be looking for ways to make their curriculum more elastic, more malleable so that they can get it out to everybody and really focus on supporting student learning on site. Which I think provides an opportunity for much more personalization or much more um, for better ability to really take kids where they are individually and move them forward. Question. And we still Peter. have Brittany to go to. <laughs> Let's not forget her. Okay. <laughs> impossible. Absolutely impossible. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, just uh, very quickly, um, what's going on with extra and co-curricular activities? So we're, um, Sean and um, Andrew, who is kind of, is, is now the interim principal at, at Moms um, for the next, for the foreseeable future. He was the assistant principal that um, we had introduced previously. Uh, they're they're talking um, right now and, and kind of getting ready for what um, it's going to look like. You probably saw the information that went out, statewide information on sports, and Sean followed up, I believe, with all the HS parents, um, sending them that those guidelines and information. So we are going to be bringing students back for extracurricular and athletics. Um, we're talking now about what that looks like. I think high school is a little clearer than middle school right now. Um, so there is conversation happening this week with regional schools that are coming together to talk about what the, the plan is for middle school. Generally, high school gets more attention and the VPA kind of, because everyone's focused on high school, that, that kind of like generally takes the lead on these kinds of things and then it's followed by um, middle school. So we are still planning to do sports with middle school. We're not sure yet if that's going to be competition with other schools and bus rides and all that, or whether it's going to be more localized. We're not, not sure about that. Um, you know, and we're planning, you know, with other extracurriculars to continue to support those. Those are really important for students and, and want to continue those. Well, the challenges of uh, uh, band, chorus, theater, have we been able to solve those? Not yet. <laughs> no, I mean, there is a question about, you know, as we, we we're starting, I mentioned earlier, we're starting in step two on the, with the state guidelines. They've said they're going to move to step three within a few weeks if things remain stable. So that, that does, if you look at those guidelines, it does give you a little bit more wiggle room. Again, it's, it's you're like living in gray here, right? Um, it's like you should maintain six feet if at all possible. That's the language changes. They just put if possible after some requirement. So I, I think we'll have to determine if that move from step two to step three has any discernible impact on you know, chorus or wind instruments, things like that. But those are all topics that everybody's talking about together too. So there is, I think, a fair bit of alignment across the state in terms of what, what's possible and what's not possible right now. And the other, just a couple of numbers things. Do you know how many kids are opting to go full remote and do you know how many uh, folks have unenrolled their kids or how many kids have unenrolled to do homeschool or some other alternative? So we have, I don't know, I don't think we've gotten back, if we just closed the choose remote or choose or, or be in person. In person is the default. Right. Uh, and then uh, parents were choosing remote. Uh, you know, I'm not sure because we don't have homeschool numbers are coming within six weeks. So we don't know, other than a survey we sent out 
a while back, which was people were thinking about it. So we don't, I don't really want to state that number as this is how many, but it, it was relatively low. Um, some, some families have chosen private school, partly because it's five days a week. I know we're talking to a few parents. I don't think that's a huge number. Vicki, Caitlin, do you have any? Yeah, so the survey asked, um, I think the deadline to apply for to homeschool students was August 1st. Yep. And the, and so the, the survey went out just before that, and we said, and the question was, have you applied or do you plan to apply to homeschool your child? And it was 2% said yes to that. Um, and uh, and we, only, we had survey responses representing about 1,300 students. So not 100%, but not a bad number, right? Yeah. So about two percent, um, and I, I think we, although we we don't have the final numbers, we're anticipating maybe as many as ten percent who choose our remote option. Those are estimates. Thanks. But well, from a numbers perspective, like how does that play out? Like a, a couple of weeks into school, you'll know. We'll know. I mean, we'll know. You'll have a count. The, the, the big <laughs> count for us is the ABM, which happens in October, and that's how we're funded. So we'll we'll know in October. We'll know how many students will be counting towards our equalized cable number. But you'll have a sense, though. Like, when do you anticipate a sense? Like the second week of September, you're going to realize, wow, I thought that family was going to be here, and now all of a sudden they're not. I think we're largely. Yeah, trusting families to say that they did because the AOE is way behind in processing their homeschool applications. Yeah. But yeah, we'll know from an enrollment standpoint. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah, we, we do an enrollment. The, the, I think the next thing is. Yeah, and I think that. I think each of the principals has been working really hard to get the exact number okay. of who's going to be on site, who's going to be off site, who's going to be completely homeschooled, or who's going to a different school. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So they've been working on that, and I've seen some of them. I you know I know. Um, Mike Lennox sent me all of his information because we're trying to get a sense for special ed purposes also of how many, you know, speech language pathologists do we need, special educators, etc. So I think the principals are almost there okay, with great. that. And then we just need to take a look at that and, and add up the numbers. And Sharon, every year Sharon just collects all that information and puts together an unofficial enrollment number by um, school, by grade level. We'll share that with you now. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, Jen. Super informative and helpful. So thank you and thank you for all the hard work. The high level questions were awesome to get a better perspective. <laughs> As a parent, <laughs> I'm feeling like when do the when do the more of the details come? And I'm just wondering if there's parents listening that might be feeling the same way. So I'm just gonna throw a couple of like detailed questions out there and feel free to answer how you can. Caitlin, you've mentioned we might learn more about sort of the learning portals sometime next week, maybe. I'm wondering when we might know, like, your kid goes to school remote on Tuesday, September 8th, and in person on, you know, Thursday. Here's what you do. Here's the protocol for how you access on Tuesday. Here's what we want you to do when you come on Thursday. You know, very specific, like from the school to the parent, A. B, I'm also wondering for students, if there are co-curriculars after school, is there transportation for students that are remote, either fully or on those days that there are practices? Are parents responsible for getting kids? To those places as their thought into that scenario and probably a trillion other things but i feel like those were sort of the ones that came up in my mind as i was listening to the conversation so far yeah so let me just ask a question you know whether your students are attending on monday tuesday versus thursday like yes like, like you're you're wondering wondering what does it look like when they come versus stay home like first day of school i don't know what i'm supposed to my kids are supposed to do. I'm anticipating that we'll hear something before then, but at this point, I haven't, and I'm just wondering when we might know that to have those conversations with our kids and, and be prepared. Um, 
I mean, so I can tell you this is going to answer that question. Uh, we are actively right now looking at okay, so what does, especially at the secondary level, the remote learning will look something like it did last year, the students still engage in their classes. We're really leaning away from those real time virtual meetings for two reasons. One, they're really challenging for all players always. Um, in terms of the structure and the scheduling and making things work, but also our teachers are teaching in person, right? And so we really want our teachers, when they're in person with students in the classroom, to be physically present with the student and mentally present with the students in the classroom. And so much of the remote learning at the secondary level will be asynchronous, not in real time. But we have carved out specific periods of time when the teachers are actively connecting with those remote students while they're not having their other students in their classroom. But so I think you can kind of imagine what it looks like for a high school student to engage in remote learning in an asynchronous fashion. At the elementary level, it needs a lot more structure than that, right? So how much time are we giving to art and music and PE? And when does that happen? And is it in real time or is it? And, and so then how much of the remote learning is, is you know, falls into the classroom teachers to organize and how much of that is bridges and ISL? We're working those questions. The, leadership team is meeting to answer a lot of those nuts and bolts questions on Wednesday. And as we have more clarity, we'll be sure to communicate. The typical communication pattern is that Peter sends out a district level communication and the principal send out a school level communication on Friday. So that's when you should look for those big updates. Um, but Caitlin, will, yeah. will, the, will the instruction for the kid come from Peter, the principal, or their teacher? on uh, it's eight o'clock or 8.30 in the morning, I'm supposed to be in school, how does it start? Who will give that instruction? My first day of school. Oh, what, do I do? what do I do? That's not gonna come from me. <laughs> that okay. be real It'll come from principal or teacher? It'll come from the principals, I would imagine, because it's, it's, it's a school level yeah. system that they're okay. welcoming students into the school and they're doing all the health and safety kids what they need to do to school level decisions. Our elementary principals work really closely to craft that communication together so that the messaging where it needs to be tight is tight and consistent. And then they and then they tailor it to their own school. So different schools have different start times and different schools will have, you know, Mary Hogan will use entrances differently than Ripton will. Sure. And so those details will be will be adjusted by individual principals. But that level of communication you should expect from the principal. Okay. At first, and then follow up from the teachers as well. Make sure. The teachers will really be working with parents about how I how I access how I use this model app, how I access the curriculum, and we and we will provide some form of training in its early stages of figuring out what that is. Training for families on using these apps. One other thing that we have to think about is if we have two different groups of kids coming, we're going to be passing out promos to everybody. So. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Monday, Tuesday kids are going to get theirs, and the, you know, the, the Thursday, Friday kids are going to get theirs later. So I'm not really sure how much is going to happen that first week because we have to pass them out. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of I asked the principals like to leave it up to them to how they want to just distribute them in the school, um, just based on what would work for them. So I'm I'm thinking probably it's going to take a week to kind of get that piece up and running um, mm -hmm. before they're going to you know they're not going to sign work on. Tuesday for kids that haven't shown up yet. Although, just to add to that, they are looking at how they're going to provide some form of support orientation for the Thursday, Friday kids at the end of next week. Okay. So that those students will have a chance to meet their teacher, get their phone book. So, so they may even be picking them up before, oh, okay. before school starts. Okay. Yeah, because the first day for Thursday, Friday students, the first day is remote. And so um, I'm not sure exactly where the plans sit at the school level, but we wrote it into the pre-service plan for next week that there will be a Tuesday, Thursday orientation. So, so students who would start Tuesday remotely have an opportunity to show up on site for orientation. We've already delivered the Chromebooks to the elementary schools yeah. and okay. signed them in G Suite. So they have post notes on them. You know, they're specific per student. We didn't do that at the high school and the middle school because we think there's going to be some kids who bring their own device choice they have. So I don't really have an exact number about how many kids who need one. And um, I've been talking to Andrew and Justin about how we're going to distribute them. Like the high school probably going to send advisory like 
home room down to the library and have students to pick them up um, during that first week or as soon as we're able to fit it in the high school schedule. So it can be a little different depending on the building. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You know, we talked earlier it's overwhelming. About it. I mean, just the idea of implementing a one to one program in a school system is unbelievable. Yeah. Implementing a new learning management system in the school system is unbelievable. And doing it all in a pandemic is ridiculous. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I don't know what else you do in a pandemic. Though. So, congratulations. Yeah. I mean, honestly, congratulations. Like, it gets you from worrying. Oh, yeah. And we're not for it. <laughs> also, just, you know, just because. You know, Kayla was mentioning we needed educators back to start building the model. So I, I think you're going to yeah. see a lot more information coming. We're now in day, we just finished day four with staff. So I think principals were waiting to do some of this work with their staff to weigh in and build it together too. So you're going to see a lot more the next week. Well, and I, I think it's hard for teachers to come back and see things that are unclear. It's also really hard to come back and have something dictated above that just flat out doesn't work. Right? And so there are things that our teachers see that I can't see from where I sit in our system. Yeah. And so really involving them in the design is critical to making sure the design functions. So we're fielding, I think, eight gazillion questions a day and looking for systematic ways to answer them to support students without penning them in the instructors. So, yeah. we're working on it. Yeah, no, I totally get it. It's our Herculean task, and I wasn't trying to say, like, oh, so why haven't we done this yet? I just anticipated that others may be having some anxiety, and so maybe to alleviate some of those concerns that, of why and what is not helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Oh. Um, I, um, thank you again. Um, I was just wondering if, um, all the teachers are expected to be um, teaching in person, or did some were some did some of them opt to not to come in person? And if not, um, what what does that look like? You know, with the distribution. Of sure. Yeah. So that was something that we um, you know, we thought about a lot as we were building a model for hybrid, and and a lot of teachers had that question because we, we left a remote period of three months where everybody was remote, so people had to become accustomed to that. We realized when we built this model, and we wanted to make a model that was transitional, fluid, fluid and transitional, and strong in each phase, that having a, a cadre of teachers teach remotely would make it really hard to then bring those students back in that teacher might be teaching, let's say, at the elementary level, that teacher was teaching students from all the different schools, then you're going to come back fully in person. It's really hard to transition that back. So you would have had to maybe make like a year-long commitment to that program and not come back. Um, and then it gets even more challenging at the secondary level if you, if you consider all the subject areas that you'd have to cover in a remote model unless you just wanted to offer like the basics, right? Like, we're going to teach four subject areas, period. That's all you get. Like, you could maybe do that and figure out a way to make that happen. Most schools at the secondary level have gone with an online learning like UTBLC, Vermont. What's the virtual learning? Collaborative, maybe. Um, so they basically, students sign up for this program and separate from their district. They're still your students, but they're they're now learning in this other spot. So that doesn't really help our teachers in terms of teaching remotely necessarily. Um, so that, that's kind of why we, we, we realized that we would not have a remote option with, the re with, I think, facing the reality that COVID is going to place all sorts of pressures on us to move between phases and we can't do that if we can't have staff teaching in person. So that and we've worked with staff that, you know, I mean a lot of people are have different levels of comfort coming back and we've been working with staff to, to process the, you know, how they're feeling, um, to talk about different leave opportunities too. Uh, we 
done. Uh, we did a Zoom a couple of weeks ago to answer questions for employees around leave. Um, and I had sent out information before that. So we're, you know, it, is it, I, I mentioned like leaning on each other uh, throughout this period. And I think this year we'll have to continue to do that and um, provide supports for, for staff as, as needed. I guess I have one other question. Uh, talking about the supports for teachers, is there a, a, a substitute teachers who are going to be available if a teacher has to opt out? That's a, a, a we saw that, that coming a long time ago. Like, oh my gosh, because we we struggle in a regular year. We struggle finding substitutes. Right. And so this year we decided to do two things differently. One, we raised the sub pay for this year. So we increased that from $100 to we ended up at 120. Um, so we're hoping that helps to attract more, more folks. And then we also have created some positions we're working to hire. We haven't filled all of them, but I think we've filled a couple of them. Uh, to have a permanent sub who we, we guarantee um, a, a, a sub position every day out of school, so um, and they're COVID aid essentially um, for this time period. So we're also doing that to try to make sure that we have coverage. But we do see that as a big challenge when you read through the guidance and you see that you know if, if I'm sick or if I'm exposed, I'm gone for 14 days. And when you start to compound that and think about contact tracing and like one student impacting, let's say it's a high school, impacting eight different teachers and like, it's, it's hard to know what, how that's all gonna unfold. And that's why one of the three criteria I sent out on Friday was appropriate staffing levels to be able to come back fully in person. So that is a, going to be for everybody. This is across the country in Vermont. Um, that is going to be a real challenge. But we don't know what's going to happen. So, yeah. you know, things could stay the way they are and we're good. So we, we just don't know, but we're, we're definitely trying to be as prepared as we can for all those different eventualities. And was there any debate on requiring a test, not just symptoms, to be considered? For, for, for the start, like the start. The test everybody prior mm -hmm. to. I have not heard that mentioned anywhere in K-12. Most of the state guidance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We are in a very different orbit from the college. But but the state could have required that. I mean, the health professionals that came together and created the guidelines could have, I would assume, could have That's only one moment in time. Then you go home to your family. Yeah, it'd be like constant. It's, it gets, it, it's like everything you've mentioned. Everything's got 10 other questions to go with it. So it's it's really overwhelming. I, I truly am overwhelmed. I was all along. I'm glad I'm not having to play a game like Jen with uh, grandchildren. But I mean, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to answer any of the questions. And grandparents have those questions too because they're going to be drafted in some ways. <laughs> uh, well, no, I mean, it, it's, it's an issue. All of the, so I, I, I guess the main point for us as board members, since we're not actually dictating this, obviously we hire you when you're doing it, but on the other side is to just, as more communication is going to be just the only way to go, because each one of us is going to have one segment to decide so what happens on Wednesdays? And uh, what happens at 8 o'clock? And what happens after school? I, I don't have a concept of that yet, honestly. I just don't, because I'm too old, I guess. Uh, but I mean, I just didn't grow up with a computer, and I didn't grow up with a screen, and I just don't have a way to. So if somebody asks me, I'm going to play ignorant. I don't. 
time to learn model yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's hard i think the important thing though i think you said it was the economy and the education are on the same track it's going to take a long time for the world to change and get back to whatever equilibrium that it was before maybe not a normal but an equilibrium that we can say we're back to a baseline and uh, that's frightening uh, but it is absolutely true so patience is important but maybe it's going to take a year and a half rather than a year so to speak for each child education to have the same impact I also want to commend you on the ambassador program. Yeah. Um, I think that's going to be very helpful. Um, are teachers going to be considered ambassadors, or are these going to be people outside of the teachers? Each school has been kind of talking through how they're going to staff that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if they determine exactly if it's going to be, you know, paraprofessionals, teachers, others. Um, so they're still, that's part of what they're working on right now. Okay. They're definitely talking about leaning into existing relationships. So there's a staff member who has a child with their family. Right. And Caitlin is part of child care, so I've sent out a few the updates. We've all seen that. That's continuing to come together. So that's good. Great. I think you're up. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I can't like see anyone's mouth moving. So it's just like, oh, no, like no, no lip reading. Yeah. Just, Suzanne and Lorraine, are you both okay? What was the question? I'm okay, except that I'm uh, I'm actually the, the nice part about doing the distancing is I screwed up my back yesterday and I had to log off from the base and lay I'm laying down with a nice pack. <laughs> Perfect. But I'm listening. Um, so I headed up the policy and operations team, and it was our job um, to deal with some of the nuts and bolts um, and the cog that keep things running. So it was a little bit tricky because a lot of the work of the other teams was very front-loaded, so it was like very fast and furious in July. And in some ways, we had to wait a little bit to see what was going to happen in the other action teams in order to... Uh, make decisions about some of these things like food service and transportation. We also dealt with personnel. Um, so some of what we did made it into this document, which is public facing. And then some of what we did was more for internal policy and procedures like employment issues. Peter mentioned that we had a um, question, an optional question and answer session for staff about um, different kinds of leaves, leave of absence, and other um, things that they could access in different situations. So we had representation from principals, uh, central office staff. We had Sean, Sean Carroll, who's the um, director of activities at the high school, as Peter asked earlier about extracurriculars and Netflix. So he um, helped a lot with that. Um, and we also had Laura Lavaca, who is our new district food service director, who has been a literal godsend. I, <laughs> can't imagine having to have gone through this um, without her expertise, so very happy for that. So the things that made it into this uh, document that are public facing that are really um, important for families to know and uh, what influences their day to day are food service and transportation. So um, foods are really complex in our district because we still have a mix. We have a management company and we have in-house programs. And um, there's also huge differences in scale. Um, so we went into this really with the underlying principle and the understanding sort of the core foundation of this is that we will provide students with daily access to meals in schools in session and on learning south site. Um, we wanted to really place a lot of focus on you know, meals being a safe and nutritious source of food, operating under the school lunch program and the school breakfast program and um, this is really different than what we did in spring 
who are able to operate under some nationwide waivers and some statewide waivers under what's actually called the Summer Food Service Program. So some of the things that we were able to do, um, for example, was drop food in coolers that no one could be there in order for us to count the meal. That waiver's expired. We actually we can't feed to a person now, so we can't do cooler drops. Um, there were other waivers about, you know, nutritional requirements because we were having trouble getting things, the supply, um, and also a, like a non-congregate eating waiver, which means that kids don't have to eat together. So that that has been extended um, for remote learning, which is a positive. Um, so, you know, meal service when students are learning on site is a little different. It's going to involve some pre-ordering. The choices will be less. Um, they'll eat in their classrooms. Um, but they'll have the opportunity to, to order, they'll get breakfast, lunch, and they'll have main entree with side dishes and some alternatives. Um, when learning off-site, it's a little different. So there's a couple opportunities for families to pick up meals sort of in bulk, so twice a week, so they don't have to come every day. Um, and we have said, you know, we'll be providing sign-ups and families can opt to pick up their food anywhere, like we'll we'll bring it around wherever it's more convenient for them, whatever school. So if they have uh, students at Ripton and a student that's at Moms and a student that's at the high school, they don't have to go through the home visits to get that food. Um, so Mondays and Wednesdays, there's a morning pickup at the elementary schools. And then on Tuesdays and Fridays, there's an afternoon pickup at the high school. So they only need to do what you know, they'll get two to three meals at a time depending on which day they go. And they only need to go on the days that they want food. So they don't need to come Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, and Friday, right? They, they choose what works best for their schedule. Um, and it's all it's all for pre-order. We've also said that we're really committed to ensuring that um, families that maybe have a situation where they're unable to pick up are able to receive meals and we'll work through that on a case-by-case -case basis. So on the sign up, there will be a place to say, I need help. Um, we've had some conversations with ACTOR who has said that they are willing to help us with that. Um, so we'll see what kind of scale we get on that. You know, when we were in a fully remote model, we used the buses, which was wonderful that we had that option. It also required a lot of staffing and it, is somewhat inefficient um, to send huge buses around with you know two coolers and empty people, uh, and also we didn't feel that we could do that um, with students on the bus because of the time it would take, and also because we can't just do cooler drops, so it increases the number of people congregating at the stops. So this is the, the model that that we came up with, and um, there's been a lot of cooperation between Laura and um, the Jen, who's the director at, for the Abbey Group. Um, so that's been really great to see we've been working together. Um, we've also done some additional trainings and obviously tightened our feeding and sanitation. Um, we've also got coming some machines called, they're called Oliver machines, and they're the machines that like seal, you can put like a tray and seal the, and they also, that will be useful for packaging for sending meals home. Some um, schools are adding groups are going to be doing some freezer meals so that they can send them to the kids. Any questions about that? Um, so transfer, for transportation, the big difference this year is that student families need to sign up for transportation. We need to know in advance who is going to be getting on the bus because seating will be assigned. And we want to make sure that we space students to the maximum extent possible. Um, health screenings are going to take place at home each morning before school. Students have to wear masks on the bus. They have to hand sanitize. They'll be hand sanitized for pumps when they get on the bus. They'll go to their assigned seat. And again, depending on the number of students on the bus, we're going to spread that as much as, much as possible. Um, we're encouraging families to find alternative routes or to drive their students to school or walk or bike if they can, just to you know try to keep things as spread out as possible on the bus. Um, that's not possible for, for everyone, so we're asking for the sign-ups. You know, you're drinking on the bus, that's a rule now, it's even more important now. We don't want kids taking their masks off very often. And we'll seat students um, you know, by 
they have to meet, of course, like their siblings will keep them together. And then like by cohort to try to maintain that integrity. So the kindergarten doesn't start from them and then going back. And then as they get off the bus, they'll put more hand sanitizer on it before they go in the building. And that's where they'll um, get their temperature. I just have a question about the food service or safety box. Mm -hmm. um, is the food going to be ordered? Like, where is the food coming from? Um, I'm imagining they're going to have to package a lot of meals. You know, it's economy is going to be ordered for the whole week. And, um, I, I just have a question about that. Like, um, have there been any discussion um, around using local resources um, like in terms of like providing fresh food, or is it all going to be ordered from? Like, how, how well, we do utilize a lot of local vendors already, um, especially for things like fruits and vegetables. Chicken. There's a lot of Vermont products. Um, there's a company called Reinhardt that we do a lot of ordering through, but we really um, prioritize using local. So um, that isn't anything new, but it definitely is a renewed focus in hiring a new service director. So um, yeah, we, we utilize local food to the maximum extent practical. Um, and then also when they're actually picking up food, they won't be getting a full week's worth on Monday, so they would come on Monday or Monday, Tuesday, and then on Wednesday they get Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So it's not quite so much. We did toy with the idea of a once a week pickup, but there's the volume is just too much. We don't actually have enough storage space. Over the in the spring, we actually had to bring when we were doing all our meals out of the high school. We actually had to bring in a refrigerated truck to store milk because there was just so much milk. We were doing 850 breakfasts and 850 lunches every day, which is more than we typically do for the district when we're in session. Thank you. I have one question. Are you getting an increased subsidy for all this extra work that's going to take? We have no. Okay. So um, we did, so for the summer food service program, which is what we were operating from March to June. The reimbursement rate is higher, okay. and we actually were able to claim all those meals under free rate reimbursement, so it was actually quite profitable because we have such high participation. Um, that's not going to be the case moving forward. We actually are unfortunately probably predicting a decrease in participation and do have some concerns about um, just what that's going to look like. We also were able to apply for some reimbursement through um, CRF, the coronavirus um, relief funds. Uh, the state gave $12 million towards the summer food service program. We were only able to claim June because it was really for June, July, and August. Um, so we were able to get like $40,000 per claim. We asked for $40,000 to be reimbursed to us for things like transporting the meals and buying coolers and packaging and stuff like that. So, but other than that, um, there's not additional subsidy. Well, one thing that we were hoping for was that the waiver would be extended um, where we could offer meals free to all students, regardless of whether they're eligible for free or due benefits. Um, it's called an area eligibility provision. And we were able to do that from March to June. The USDA has indicated that they don't have the funding for that, so I don't think that's something that we're going to see, unfortunately. No. Well, thank you very much. I mean, just Herculean efforts. Uh, just unbelievable. So thank you. Uh, next up. Brittany, I think you're up next. Okay, this is, this is a, I was talking to Peter earlier. It feels nice to just have some things that are routine. Yes. <laughs> we do every August, we approve our fuel and propane bids. Really simple. So we put, we except put except last year. Last year there was a lot of drama. This year, oh I promise to bring you something more simple. So 
Um, we had two bidders for fuel, two bidders for propane. Um, clearly, the I usually go with a fixed price bid over a pre-buy. Pre-buy is a lot of initial cash outlay, and it's really not very much savings. Um, so I just recommend Champlain Valley fuels with a fixed price of one sixty-five, and then for fuel and Powell Brothers at one twenty-three for a fixed price of propane. This is less than last year. It's good. See some savings hopefully in the area of fuel. I make a motion that we accept that. Second. Uh, any comments or concerns? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Suzanne Lorraine? Aye. <laughs> Aye, but you guys are getting really muffled. It's really becoming a struggle to hear and understand what you're saying. Sorry. Did you get that, Suzanne? What? Did you get that? I think that Chip made the motion. I have no clue who seconded it. I think it was Mary. Mary? Yeah. Okay. Great. Any opposed? Great. So moved. Next up. Uh, committee updates. Why don't we start with finance? Any committee update? No. Great update. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll come back to you yeah, yeah. at the end of communications. Okay. Sure. Um, so communications, um, you all should have seen the um, board newsletter that went out on Friday and where we were able to announce the porch conversations um, and we've already gotten six responses, so uh, we're going to be doing some quick scheduling. We probably need to figure out what's the easiest way. Like, I, if I had access to your calendar, then I could yeah, waste time. That, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, because um, but, but at any rate, um, I've already got at least a Google spreadsheet. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but that's so that's exciting. Um, and um, in the meantime, we recorded the first three e chats. And I was leaving Vicki and and Caitlin alone until at least this week, and then we'll get you guys on the schedule. I was just sending you an email. It's like, oh my god, I no, 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 and I, no, no, no. Uh, no, I was I was hands off until you know, yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll get those. Oh, fantastic. Um, so the first three, just to remind people and for our, our students, um, one is the history of ACSD, and that's um, Mary talking to Peter and Peter and Suzanne. And then there's um, one on the facilities master plan, and that's Mary talking to Victoria and um, Peter, right? Yeah. Well, the history, Peter talked to uh, Suzanne and Peter. Yeah. Right. And then I talked to Victoria and Peter, Peter for on facilities. Master. Facility. Yeah. Right. And then Victoria talked with Jen and me about um, engagement to date and looking forward. Um, they all ended up a little too long, so we're in the process of deciding, is there anything that we can cut or, um, or do we just ch chunk them into smaller pieces because we really want people to watch them. The whole idea is for community members to be able to access information in a time that's convenient for them. So if they're 20 minutes, we don't want someone to not watch at all. So um, that's where we are, but, but at least they've been um, recorded. Um, and then I don't know if people have noticed, but if, if you haven't um, check out our section on the website, um, Eric has done a lot of work already and really trying to streamline the information, make it way more accessible. She's got the great icon so far. And uh, anyway, so so we feel like there's huge progress so far um, and she's working on making the newsletter sort of like our landing page and our board update um, so that people will get used to be knowing where to go to look for stuff. Um, and that will be able to drive people there and really make sure that that people are able to access the information when they want it and without having to do more than one or two clicks. <laughs> that's the idea. So um, yeah, I think I think that's it. Great. Yep. Thank you for everything you've been pushing through. Really quite oh, impressive. Thanks. You and the team have done an amazing job. Have. Really great team. Um, negotiations were executive session. I don't think we have any need for an executive session. Uh, uh, 
just to say uh, no news to report. For instance, our last meeting, uh, we're looking to reschedule, or not reschedule, but schedule our next meeting um, coming up next week. Uh, I did have a question for Peter, however. Uh, we have a, you know, an agreement with the support staff. Does the board need to vote on that contract or just the fact that the three of us signed off on it was sufficient? Um, our past practice is bringing it to the board. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. I just want to make sure there's not a timing issue. We've already passed. We're, the, we're working with them right now on some of the, the details of the equity portion. Yeah. That, so, um, Trini, what are your thoughts on that? About a timing issue. Yeah. Um, I think that I think the timing issue isn't going to be a result of the board not having voted on it. Okay. Because you got the tentative agreement yeah. signed yeah. by the three of us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think they would, they would move forward. Maybe when you and I and, and Chris talk on Monday, clarify that. We can finalize that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Great. And then facilities, uh, Victoria was unable to be here tonight. Um, Peter, do you have any update with regards to next steps with so we talked to David Epstein, and um, he's working on an outline based on what the board talked about at the retreat, in an outline of the process from here to the, the winter. And so that would frame how many more facilities meetings there are. Um, we're getting into a more regular pattern right now. We were kind of planning the meetings after we had some information to share, and I think we're now getting into more of a kind of set schedule um, so he's putting that together. Um, I think we're probably looking at a meeting coming up in maybe the third week of September. It looks like would be the next meeting, and then I would imagine that the meetings would follow in succession after that. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and then I guess just jump right into policy there. Okay, uh, the policy committee uh, is presenting three policy drafts for review and discussion. Uh, we've talked a little bit about them in the past, but we would like to move these forward and hopefully vote on them in September. Um, the first one is electronic communication between employees and students. Um, I don't know if anybody has questions, if they've been able to read through them and look at them. Um, but basically, this is just uh, electronic communication between employees and students, and it's it's about you know making sure that it, there's no inappropriate uh, communication going on, and that there's um, uh, consequences should there be. Um, one of the big issues that came up again was the procedure that would need to be written so that uh, students and their families understand what the uh, policy is so that they would be able to, if there's a question about something inappropriate that's gone on, how they report it and have action taken to investigate or whatever. So again, it was around policy or procedures. Um, and what would you have? Okay. So I don't know if you could share that with uh, the board so that we can look at that. Okay. Um, and then uh, these, the transportation policy is kind of an open policy uh, saying that the school can offer uh, transportation for students who need it. It doesn't guarantee it. Um, and I think this year, because of the adjustments that have needed to be made, um, parents are opting in if they want transportation. Nobody will be denied uh, a means to come into school, but it's not a guarantee. I mean, you're not automatically put onto a bus route. You have to opt in for that. Um, so the policy is sort of open to that, to those um, changes where there's a situation that requires the schools or the administration to offer different types of transportation. And just for clarification, for my yeah. st designated stops, that, could, that what does that mean? Does that mean like we're, we have a policy that says 
the district picks the, where the stops are. For elementary. elementary schools, we always pick up at a child's house. How does that work? Yeah, well, right now there are there is a lot of, of house pickup, like right at houses and not a ton of group stops. And that's something that we'll have to look at as we move forward for the facilities master plan, no matter what we do. But designated stops could be in front of someone's house or it could be a group stop. Okay. It's just the stops that we set. Great. Okay. And then the third policy was the equity policy. Uh, we basically used the um, Vermont uh, School Board Association's model policy and changed a little bit of the uh, grammar, possibly, and uh, made some minor changes. And the idea was that the policy is broad and encompasses, um, you know, um, not only. Uh, racial or ethnic diversity, but also uh, religion, uh, socioeconomics, uh, geography, a, a whole blend of ways to uh, make education more equal. Um, and that equality is a bigger thing more than just um, racial. So um, with the understanding that, as Peter said at our last meeting, that you know, the idea of once this policy gets into place that you would um, suggest a strategic plan to define it and set uh, outcomes, et cetera, um, through this policy. I have one question on the word initial proficiencies. Uh, Can you tell me where that's at? It's in the first paragraph uh, of policy. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I guess I just, I mean, geography, class, ability, language, gender, sexual orientation, that type. But initial proficiency, I guess I, I don't know what that means. Can you explain that one? We had, we had, uh, we, we looked at this and we. Uh, is that student, bed, like, if, is that student based on student benchmark? So where a kid comes in from an acumen perspective? Yeah, we think. Well, yeah. good. I'm glad I wasn't the only one. Yeah, no, this. we. I did read it. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we kind of looked at that yeah. and, and we really, we didn't change it because we wanted to see what other, what other people were thinking about that. But yeah, we, we kind of went back and forth okay. on that one. Yeah. So where a student comes in, we don't always know who's, you know, where they're going to be when they get here. It's not going to stop them from matter, right? accessing. Yeah, it shouldn't matter. Yeah, right. it shouldn't matter. Right. Right. That's what I assume, but I'm yeah. not. Yeah, that was kind of the general yeah. consensus that we had too. So, Mayor, our job is to review these and then we're going to vote on we're them. We're going to vote on them. Yeah. Hopefully Hopefully have a discussion in September. In September and mm -hmm. vote on mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay. We have one more policy. We're working all three. Yes, we're working all three. Okay. We have another policy we're working on, which is the uh, recruitment hiring uh, policy. And that still has some legal language we had to. Claire, you guys are doing a great job, Mayor. Thank you. Really, you are busting <laughs> rocking it. It's going to be Wait. very, it's going to be very nice to have this policy in particular because people are always saying, "Well, what do you mean by equity?" And now we have an actual document that says what we mean by it. And that's going to drive decision making. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's going to be a huge part of it. And there's, there's, but there is significant work that's going to be done by Peter and his team that mm -hmm. bring this to life and practice. Right. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. part of the project. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And one of, one last thing is our one of our goals as a policy committee is that we want to make sure that procedures that define that come out of the policy are in a place where people can find them, including us, including parents, including students, staff, whatever. So we're trying to figure out a way to make sure that happens. Identify where they're at and where they're located, and hopefully have them either uh, electronic electronic link to them so that if a parent is reading the policy, they can go directly to the procedure and see what it is. Okay, that's our ultimate goal. Some of the policies won't have a procedure, some do. Right, I know. Yeah. yeah. Super. Uh, yeah, I have a couple good. of questions on the yep. social yeah. if that's okay. Um, so Mary, on the first one about the electronic communication, right. I still am taking an issue with this no communication from students after 10 p.m. And I just, I know I brought it up the last time when you first showed it to us. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, it just, it feels to me that it's a different level of some of those other issues. 
especially if the student wants to say submit an assignment that's due the next day, but they don't know if they can wake up at eight in the morning to submit their assignment on time. And I'm just I'm wondering if the administration felt strongly about putting this in place to kind of have some boundaries where students, you know, I get that at night inappropriate things could happen, or maybe you just want students to be disconnected from media. I'm just wondering how a, a, a conversation between a teacher and a student of a sexual nature falls in the same category as a student sending an email to a teacher after 10 o'clock at night. It has the same consequences according yeah. to this policy. Uh, what uh, I think what we were trying to say in this is that you, a student could submit no, anything. No. Is that in there? No. Well, it says communications between an employee and a student. Right. So, so that there would have to two ways. It's a back and forth. Which is a back and forth. I saw it as a student may not email a teacher after 10, 8, 10 p.m. The teacher can post assignment or a blog, but a student may not do any communication. No. It, it means that they will not get a response until six. The okay. teacher's not required to respond All right. after it a certain time. It wasn't clear to me. So yeah. maybe if that is the intention, maybe we need to clarify yeah. that piece. Because to me, it felt like they were violating the policy if they emailed after 10 at night. Um, and also, were you thinking of doing some sort of a student-to-student -student communication in this? Or is there a certain, a different policy where students are I think that's going to be a different policy for what? This is this is between employees and students. Yeah. 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 So is there? I didn't know if, if there was a separate policy for student to student communication or electronic interactions between students, or that just a separate like including it in a that's a, that's disciplinary a policy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So nothing we have to worry about. And then for the transportation policy, there is a specific line that said. I should read it. Go ahead. I have to open it. Uh, a specific line that said this district union may furnish transportation on public roads to students who reside within the district. So I didn't know if we need something where we're providing transportation to students outside of the district, which we do, and we do it on a regular basis, and if that needed to somehow be included in this policy. Not that we're mandated to provide that, but that we may, which is basically what that said. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's tricky because, you know, we're not required, right? right. I mean, some states, transportation is a requirement, it's not here, but it is anyway, right? It's like, no one would ever stop transportation, so it's a requirement for student need. Um, I think in the policy itself, I, I don't know if you'd want to it beyond the district boundaries. I think that's like a kind of a one off thing yeah, that, that we do. That adds a level of yeah. obligation that yeah. we don't yeah. want to have. Yeah. Except for kids who are on a specialized education plan, they may need transportation outside of the district, and that would be probably covered in that education plan. Yeah, I think I think Paul's the last one referencing is he sent him a bus to Hancock, Hancock. Right. Randall, oh. Rochester, mm -hmm. um, for moms and elementary students. We have a lot of students. Right. right. But we want the flexibility to yeah, stop that and start that. Right. Totally. And I think this gives you the flexibility to start and stop it. Right. Right. I think we're in violation of your policy by picking up students outside of the district based on the policy. But, but maybe I'm overreading it and overthinking it. To me, it sounds like we're if we're saying what we can and cannot do, we're not allowing ourselves to pick up those kids in, in, out of our district. Because if there's no other statement anywhere with regards to how we deal with out of district transportation, correct? Right. Correct. Right. There isn't. Yeah. I don't think this is this policy is saying we can't. It's not saying it's not it's not making it so that's not possible. Well it doesn't say we will pick up students within our district, it says we may. It does it, and so basically it's saying we may pick up students within our district. To me implies we, we will not pick up students outside of our district. Yeah, that's a different interpretation of may. Yeah. I mean, in this case, may means it's still optional, right? right? But we have the right we have the you know whatever. but only to pick up students within our district. We are not saying we may pick up students outside of our district. Yeah, could it be under under certain circumstances or under certain situations, the board may alter or change transportation options 
for students based on unanticipated or emergency situations, or we no, could no, say, no, don't, don't I would call don't. it an emergency. We've done it for the past three years. No, right? I know, but could we change that last sentence to in, incorporate out of district students who were tuitioned in or whatever? I, my recommendation is you include something that says something about picking up kids out of district because. Or have I a policy like yeah. or, a, or a separate, separate policy, policy that you know, included in tuitioning in students. Do you have a do you have a policy about tuition and students, or do you have a policy about residency? But I don't think that there's a policy specifically about tuition and students. It's just about residency. I mean, you could say something like the board reserves the right to set additional rates for students attending an ECSD school from outside the district. Yeah, something like that. Okay. I, I, I think yeah. that would be lovely. Mm -hmm. I think, okay. Yeah, I think something like that is necessary. All right. We'll send that revised draft out then. Great. Hey, Betty? Great. Um, I was uh, uh, wondering if you're hoping to make uh, the list. I know you said it's not limited to the following, but are you hoping to make it a little more um, comprehensive to include at least most of, like, I'm not seeing anything about. Um, you know, racist or that kind of, of content and paying tax on nature. Um, under, under the equity policy? Uh, no, no, under, no, under the data training. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, some of the inappropriate. Mm. Oh, okay. Definitely on the, on the uh, yeah. inappropriate right. sexual content. Yeah. Right. And, and it does. Um, in the bottom, it says um, that it may cross with other policies that we have specific to um, hazing, harassment, and bullying. Mm -hmm. So we felt that that was addressed through that cross uh, policies. Okay. Also, number five, communications that are harassing, intimidating, or demeaning. Mm -hmm. This is the, the whole draft, the BSBA right. draft, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is the state model. Right. Well, you'll take that feedback then. Okay. 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 Great. Any other comments, questions? Yes, sir. Hi. I'm Kyle here. Um, just to clarify on technology policy. So. I'm often a student that often works um, usually around the clock at a homework assignment or so forth. Um, I email a teacher at 1230. Um, you know, I, um, that's an honor to be email, yes. But um, with, the, with the circumstances of that nature being, in, in, in case of any questioning behind that, being um, that, oh, well, this email is clearly communicating. I will be absent from class during your class. Thank you for your time. Then deal. Yeah. Um, therefore, that be allowed versus in the situation of a, of a, a misconduct or inappropriate email or so forth. Mm -hmm. Correct? Right. Okay. Thank you, you can communicate anything you need to about scheduling or assignments or, or okay. whatever. Yes, yeah. that's what I thought. Right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? So we will look forward to those okay. for both our next board meeting. Any other? No other. Great. And we do not have an executive session requirement. Perfect. So the next thing we need then is a motion to adjourn. Sure. Oh, it's my Mary thing. You got oh. it, girl. That's what I thought. I'll second. Great. We are all set. Thank you all very much. And welcome to our new student representatives. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Little did I know what they got in.